The story I'm about to share still has an effect on me. And sometimes I wake up in the middle of the night with nightmares, dreaming about it. It was a dark, overcast day. There was a mist in the air, a haze we get sometimes in California. I'd been laid off from a job that I'd been working at for nine years. I'd been tuning pianos off and on over the years, but I hadn't been doing it for the last few years because while working full time, I didn't have time with the demands of my full time work to do it. Well, that changed when I was laid off. I started tuning pianos to make ends meet while I searched for a new job. There was a message on my phone. The voice on the message was faint and a bit hard to hear, requesting a piano tuning. I called back later and set up a tuning appointment. When I arrived at the piano house, I looked through a tall maze of weeds at the house through my car window. The house was ominous and old and had faded drooping wood slabs that were gray from years of neglect. The house had a presence about it that made me feel uneasy. I drove toward the house. The road leading to it was full of cracks with weeds creeping through the cracks. The road was framed on both sides with eight foot limestone rock walls. I parked and I got my piano tuning kit and approached the front door. The front door's doorbell wires were frayed so I could see the doorbell wouldn't work. I knocked loudly three times. I could hear my door knocks echoing throughout the house and there was a rustling of someone moving behind the door as someone approached. I could see a silhouette of someone approaching through the thick curtains. The door opened slowly. An older woman peered up at me through a dark room from behind the door. She gestured me to follow. I followed her. The room's darkness sported shadows that covered her face. She pointed to an upright piano sitting in a corner in the room. There was one dim light in an opposite corner in the room. When I first entered the room, because of the room's darkness, I wasn't able to see the woman's face clearly. As my eyes adjusted, I could see the old woman was dressed in an old gray dress with a lace scarf. She was holding a small leather-bound book that she clutched into her chest. I walked to the piano. I took out a flashlight, and with its light guiding me, I started to remove the top cover screws in preparation to tune the piano. The old woman watched me curiously as I removed the screws holding the piano cover in place. I looked down at the piano keys and could see that some of the piano keys were worn and had broken ivory tops missing, but it still seemed playable. As my eyes continued to adjust to the darkness of the room, I could start to see a bit clearer and I looked over. The old woman was watching, and I glanced at her face. I was startled as one of her eyes was glazed over with a dull glow reflected from the room's only light, giving her a terrifying appearance, trying not to show my surprise. I looked away from her face around the gloomy room. There was an old tattered music box and some shelves with old bound books. I noticed that there weren't any framed photos. The whole experience so far left me uneasy. I put my piano tuning kit on the table and got my tools ready to begin tuning. For all pianos, there are many keys that have three strings for each key. The strings must be tuned to play in unison together for the same note. Having any of these out of sync can cause the sound for a key to have a twangy tone not the desired clear, in tune, unison tone. The time passed as I tuned the piano. I got halfway into tuning the piano and I realized that I would not be able to tune it because the strings that I tightened quickly unraveled because the soundboard that held the string pins was broken and it wouldn't be able to hold the tension of the strings. I realized because of my concentration that I did not notice the older woman was no longer there watching me. I was alone. I called out loudly to the old woman to give her the bad news. Ma'am? No response. I called out again. No response. I wondered if maybe the old woman had left without my noticing to run an errand or such. 
I went to my piano tuning kit case and searched for a piece of paper and a pen. Holding the flashlight, I started writing a note explaining why I would not be able to tune the piano. I heard a slight muffling from the back of the house. I stopped writing and listened. Silence. I waited a few seconds and called out again. No response. I ignored my rising fear as my arms began to fill with goosebumps. I continued writing the note. I called out again, hello, is anyone there? But there was no response. I heard some scuffling coming from a different place from before. The silence in between the muffling sounds was stifling. Hello, I called out. I'm going to be leaving. I'm not able to tune your piano because there's a problem with the piano. No response. I did hear more muffling sounds that were getting closer to me. I have to get out of here now, I thought to myself. I quickly packed my piano tuning tools, tuning rod and other tools into my kit. I looked around the room. I did not want to have to come back if I missed anything, ever. I had to make sure that I had everything before leaving. I rushed to the door and dropped the flashlight in my haste, and it rolled under on an ornate desk. It would not be reachable without moving the heavy desk. I left it and ran out of the door to my car. I looked toward the house and thought I saw one of the curtains moving slowly, but I couldn't be sure if it was real or my imagination being so terrified at that point. I was overcome by an overwhelming feeling of being watched coming from the house. I felt like the old woman was watching into my very soul. It's hard to describe the unsettling feeling I experienced, but it was draining, deeply encompassing. It left me feeling like I was on the verge of passing out with panic. It also left me feeling very tired. I wasn't sure exactly where from the house it emanated from. There were many windows in the house. It could have been coming from any of them. As I began to back out from the house, I realized I would not be able to drive away to get out of there fast. Every part of me wanted to race out and back away from that house as fast as possible, spinning my tires, screeching out of the driveway. But to do so would have caused me to scrape the car door on either side of the narrow facing stone walls on each side of the path of the road. I would have to drive out slowly and thus endure the overwhelming presence I was feeling. The road being a hundred feet was long to me. It felt like miles. Finally, I reached the main road and turned out onto it to leave the place. I let out a breath of relief. I drove away rattled as I wiped cold sweat off my brow. It was not till later, thinking about what had happened, that I realized how scary that experience was. Looking back on it, I wondered to myself, if that was a ghostly specter that had drawn me into a trap like an insect caught by a spider's web, or was it just some crazed older woman wanting to drain my energy like an energy vampire or such? I leave it to you to decide. Nestled in the foothills of Ventura, California, is my grandmother's house. It sits at the top of the hill in a picturesque neighborhood flanked by views of the rolling hills behind. It's a large, spacious, two-story dream house with a shaded garden and a large patio. Naturally, it was the idyllic family gathering place for decades. But despite its charm, something about Grandma's house has never been quite right. Growing up, I was terrified of the house. Even during those big, happy family gatherings while playing with all my cousins and siblings, I never felt at ease. I always felt as if there was something lurking just behind what I could see. I'm not the only one in the family to have experienced these things. My mom, siblings, aunts, cousins have all witnessed and felt unexplainable things throughout the years. The most notable occurrence that the whole extended family witnessed happened during a family Christmas party one year. Either I hadn't been born yet at this point, or I was too young to remember. So I'm relaying my mom's recollection of the event. According to her, the entire family was gathering downstairs to exchange Christmas presents. 
From the sitting room where everyone was, there was a clear view of the wooden staircase and the upstairs landing. Everyone was merrily talking to each other, when suddenly they heard heavy footsteps walking across the wood floor of the hallway upstairs. That was odd. Everyone in the family was downstairs and accounted for. The group all fell silent and glanced upstairs. The footsteps continued. By this point, the person walking would have been in full view of the family. But still they saw no one. The mysterious footsteps reached the landing and proceeded downstairs. Every footstep on that wooden staircase was loud and echoed across the room. The footsteps walked all the way down the staircase, eventually halting for a moment at the bottom of the stairs, just near feet away from where the family was gathered. Everyone looked at each other. Then the footsteps began again, this time continuing on and walking past where they were sitting, heading out of sight and through the kitchen before finally disappearing out the back door. Most of what the extended family witnessed over the years was mild and easily brushed off. The worst happenings always seemed to be concentrated around my immediate family. Whatever the reason, the thing that exists in that house has a particular distaste for my mother and her children. My mom's experiences started before I was born. Shortly before the birth of their second child, my mother and father moved into this parent's house, my grandmother's. From the very beginning, strange things began happening. My mom would hear movement downstairs, despite being the only one home. One day, she was upstairs working on something, when she heard the rear sliding door of the house downstairs open and close again. Knowing she was the only one there, she got up to check. As she walked, she heard the door downstairs start opening and closing repeatedly. Then came the sounds of furniture moving and scraping across the floor, as if several people were moving things about, as she stood there, paralyzed. The small family dog came sprinting upstairs, arcing and grept stairs landing, and peered down, but saw nothing. As soon as she came into view, all of the noises stopped. As she turned to head back down the hallway, the noises resumed with a fury. She turned back and looked again only to once again find everything still and quiet. This happened several more times, before my mom finally retired to her bedroom, only to have the noises stop entirely. On a different day, my mom was showering upstairs. Someone knocked on the bathroom door and called her name. My mom responded, shouting over the running water. The person on the other side of the door didn't answer. Instead, they started knocking faster and louder while repeating her name. Finally, my mom turned off the water and dried off to go see what the person wanted. Wrapping a towel around herself, she opened the bathroom door to find an empty hallway. On another occasion, my mom was in the later stages of pregnancy with one of my older brothers and was heading downstairs from the upstairs landing. As she reached the top of the staircase, she suddenly felt a strong hand shove her, trying to throw her down the tall wooden stairs. She caught herself on the railing just before she fell. She spun around to confront her attacker. But again, no one was there. There were times when strange things happened that my mom was blamed for. One afternoon, my grandmother had just finished washing and putting away the kitchen silverware. My mom went into the empty kitchen to grab a glass of water and then retreated upstairs. A few minutes later, my grandmother yelled angrily up at her for her to come downstairs. My mom entered the kitchen to find it a mess. The kitchen drawers were laying across the floor in disarray with all the silverware strewn across the ground. As they were the only two at home, my grandmother blamed my mom for it, no matter how much she tried to convince her that she had nothing to do with it. On a different night, my mom and dad were in their room talking when they were interrupted by a knock on the bedroom door. My mom said, come in waiting for whoever was on the other side to open the door. All was silent for a moment, and no one came in. My parents shrugged to each other and continued talking. A moment later, the knock happened again. Again, they both fell silent. My mom called out for whoever it was to come in. This time, the doorknob slowly turned. The door slowly creaked open. But at first, it looked like there was no one on the other side. 
That is until my mom looked closer. On the other side of the door handle was a woman's hand. There was no body connected to it, only the lone, disembodied hand. The hand was small and unbelievably pale white, tipped with crimson red fingernails. After a moment of staring at it in horror, the door slowly closed again. The incident with the disembodied hand wouldn't be the last. I saw it myself years later while playing. One afternoon, my cousins and I were all involved in a classic game of hide-and-seek. One cousin and I both decided to hide upstairs in the very same red room that my mom and dad had slept years before. We hid behind a folding table in the room and giggled, shushing each other. After a few minutes, we heard the door to the room open. She and I peeked over the top of the table to a ghastly sight. No one stood in the doorway. The only sign that someone was there was that horrific woman's hand clutching the doorknob. As long as I live, I will never forget that horrible, deathly paleness of it and the color of those bright red nails. My, co my cousin and I both screamed and ducked back behind the table. When I finally gathered the courage to peek back at the door, the hand was gone. This wouldn't be the only thing I experienced while in the company of my cousin. One day we were laying in a hammock in the backyard together. Both were completely still, enjoying the warm summer day. Suddenly the hammock flipped violently and cast us both into the ground. My cousin slammed her head into the metal support for the hammock, and we both laid there in a daze for a moment, wondering what had happened. Neither of us had moved. After that we didn't sit together in that hammock any more. One night my cousin and I had a sleepover. A friend of ours and I slept on the floor in a pile of blankets, while my cousin slept with her mom in the bed. We fell asleep without a problem, but something woke me in the middle of the night. When I opened my eyes, I saw a large black shadow standing at my feet between me and the door. I didn't have my glasses on, so I squinted at it for a moment, assuming that it was our friend and that she had gotten up to use the bathroom. I brushed it off rolling over, and went back to sleep. The next morning my cousin informed me that she had seen a black shape leaning over me during the night, and that our friend, who I had mistakenly attributed the shadow to, was still sleeping soundly beside me the entire time. And while these stories are certainly unnerving, I've saved the best for last. This is one of my earliest and most horrifying memories. I was young, probably four or five years old. My grandparents had a shaded, fenced-in garden on the side of the house. Close to the side door was a small koi pond. I loved watching them swim in that pond as a child. One day I was standing about two feet back from the pond while watching the fish. I was alone in the garden, but I suddenly felt like someone was there with me. Before I could react, I felt two strong hands push me from the center of my back, sending me careening forward until I landed face first in the pond. The pond was shallow. I should have been able to stand up, but instead I felt those same strong arms holding me down underneath the water. I struggled and thrashed, trying to claw my way out to no avail. After a moment I was jerked out of the pond and into fresh air. Thankfully my mom had been watching from inside and witnessed the entire incident. She had seen me suddenly fall forward and leapt into action. As she came to pull me from the water, it looked as if someone was holding me under. As soon as I was out of the water, I started sobbing and screaming. I insisted that I'd been pushed and swore up and down that it had been my older brother, as he was the type to do that sort of thing. I refused to believe it had been him, because I knew that someone had pushed me. But my brother had been inside the entire time and was nowhere near the garden when that happened. I was entirely alone. Many more things happened over the years in Grandma's house, far too many to detail in such a short amount of time. All I know is that, somehow, there is something in that house, something that holds a grudge against my mom and my family. I have since moved far away from that house, and whatever inhabits it, and as far as I'm concerned, no amount of distance will ever be enough. 
Haunted High School. This is a special story because my older sister, my mother, my grandmother, my great grandfather, and me have all experienced unexplainable phenomenon at this high school, or the grounds of it at least. So you can be sure that the ghosts that haunt the high school halls are anything but a hoax. For you to understand this story, you need to know a few things. I'm sensitive to the paranormal, to the point where my mother, who was a skeptic, now firmly believes. And this school was in the middle of a pecan orchard or cotton fields, so it got very dark and ominous at night. And even during the day, it was so solitary at the right time, it wouldn't be hard to believe something was in a tree, window, or corner watching you. Everyone who goes to or went to this school knows the story of Anna. In the first years of the school opening, a student named Anna, last name unknown, had planned to attend the dance party and was being hosted by the school. Some say it was a prom, others a homecoming, and some say it was a football game. Whatever the event, she was at the school after dark and was led away from the crowd by a janitor. He didn't really have a name, but he comes into play later, so we'll call him Johnny. Johnny stowed away Anna in the basement underneath the oldest part of the school, the old English building. He then, he then proceeded to rape and kill her. People say that when you drive past that night, you can see her looking ominously out of one of the windows that faced the road. Johnny somehow later locked himself in the room that led to the basement. He was stuck in a way that no one would find him until it was too late. Some people say that he cooked in the little room due to the hot summers and poorly insulated room. Others say he starved. Nearly everyone had agreed that a weird feeling was near that door, especially the girls. When my grandmother went to the high school, she liked to fix her makeup in the girls' bathroom. One day before she got settled into doing her makeup, she slipped into one of the stalls to use the bathroom. The bathroom was empty, as she sat on the toilet. Her favorite mascara fell out of her pocket and rolled into a stall three down from her. She bent down to watch where the mascara landed so she could grab it when she was all done. She saw no feet, no bags, no other girls were in the bathroom. When she straightened up, she heard a weird scraping sound, and then she felt something tap her foot. Looking down, she was horrified to find her mascara right next to her shoe. She booked out of there and never went into that bathroom alone again. She added that the mascara had fallen and had a scrape mark like it was dragged, not simply dropped. My grandmother experienced other minor things there but nothing she would tell us as avidly as that. Like I said, my mother was a skeptic. Nothing too big happened to her when she was going to the high school, but it was persistent enough for her to notice. She'd hear her name called in empty hallways. She'd feel someone pulling her backpack or sweater and turn around to find no one there. But the biggest thing that happened was with whom now I think was Johnny. My mom walked around campus a lot with no one else around. The original building that was made is what we now call the Old English Building, a two-story building that was essentially one long hallway that turned abruptly right into what we used as the only gym. But it's now the girls' gym. From where my mother was standing when this happened, to her right was a set of stairs that led to the girls' gym. And under the stairs was a door to a room that custodians used for their plumbing tools. That was also the door that led to the basement. As my, mom path, as my mom passed, she heard that door there slam shut. And then there was a banging on the large heavy metal door. The banging was so hard and fast that the door rattled. My mom took a step toward the door and suddenly heard a voice. Then she hurried and walked up to touch the door and the banging and voice stopped. She answered by saying something like she'd bring back help and to calm down. As soon as she stopped touching the door and turned to get a custodian, the voice and banging resumed. She brought a custodian down. The banging and voice had stopped, and the custodian got mad for wasting his time and stomped off. My mother's English teacher told her not to worry about that noise. It was just the custodian. 
That's what the ghost was more widely known as. However, my mom thought it was another student messing with her. She had a lot of guy friends who would be able to slam and bang a door like that until it rattled. They were always trying to scare her. So that's what she chalked it up to at the time. My sister entered the high school the year before I did, and small things happened to her that would sometimes scare her. But it wasn't until the following year when I joined her there that things kicked up for the both of us. That August before going to breakfast, my sister and I were doing our makeup at the mirror that we shared in our room. I was acting like a brat. I was acting like a brat. And I didn't let her finish putting on her makeup. She only had mascara left. So she went into the bathroom at the school cafeteria. After she entered the bathroom, she felt a cold chill. But thought maybe the AC was working extra hard. Because it gets hot out there. My sister had been trying to put her mascara back into her backpack when she dropped it and it disappeared. She was alone in the bathroom, on her hands and knees, all out searching for makeup. Finally, she gave up and turned to the sinks to wash her hands. The mascara was rolling toward her. As the wall itself had spat it out, she got real freaked out by it and got out of there quick to join her classmates. The old English building was a particularly hated building for me. The first time I ever entered it, I was with my first real boyfriend who, at the time, was trying to convince me to go to bed with him. Being a freshman in high school, I didn't want to, but not wanting to upset my first real boyfriend, I didn't outright tell him no. When we walked into the old English building, nothing really happened right away. We were holding hands, trying to familiarize ourselves with the school and where our classes would be. We talked leisurely through the halls, and suddenly it was like I ran smack into a wall. I was struck mid-stride, one foot in front of me, one back, and for whatever reason I let go of his hand with so much disgust that I don't recall, that I kind of pushed him too. I remember feeling like I was surrounded by this whirlwind of stop, don't do it, turn around, no, don't, stop. Not those words, but that sentiment just engulfed me. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw that we had just passed the doors to get to the girls' gym. Beneath that would be the basement that Anna was found in, and the room that Johnny the custodian was found in. Suddenly, suddenly, I heard whispered right into my ear, sharp and frantic, and then I was released. My boyfriend at the time had no idea what had just happened, and just stared at me, very obviously concerned. I just asked him if we could go back to the library, our geeky hangout, and I practically dragged him out of the building. I took the advice and broke up with him, and learned almost shortly afterward that he attempted to force himself on another girl. The next real time I was affected was when I was in the school paper. As I said, almost everyone attending the school had either heard something or experienced something. It was actually a point of fascination for a lot of us, to the point where the newspaper teacher asked me to put a team together and report our findings in the yearbook. I got the team together, but again, got a horrible feeling about it. We did research, wrote out our article, and we all thought of ways to extend this portion of the newspaper. It was October, so we needed a story to sell newspapers. The teacher suddenly burst in with a custodian and happily reported, We're going in, guys. Grab the cameras and tape recorders. The teacher was a little old school, so we had to use handheld recorders. We have clearance for our team to go into the basement, the teacher gleefully added. My blood turned to ice. I felt the presence of that same entity. One of the editors, someone I'd told my ghost stories to, mentioned to the class that it wasn't a great idea that I go, as my presence usually makes ghosts stronger. So the teacher only took the team and left me to edit some of the articles. Less than an hour later, the team came pouring in, buzzing and excited and all chattering at once. They all held some random things, an old Converse shoe, a very old tennis racket, an old lunch tray. I turned and looked at the teacher 
and blurted out, Which one of you has the red book? They all stopped and stared at me. I didn't plan on asking them that question. I had planned on asking how it went and joking about who got spooked the most. But that question came out instead. The same student who told the teacher I should stay behind came from the back of the group from where I couldn't see him and held out a large, thick, red dictionary in his hand. I didn't touch it. I nodded and finished editing the paper. I felt like throwing up the rest of the day. I had no idea how I would have known about that book. That same student took the book home and didn't report any paranormal phenomenon at home. This is a story from Lincolnshire in the United Kingdom. I was talking to my mom today, and at the end of our conversation, she meekly said she had a story for me. It's funny, I thought she would have been enthusiastic to share this story, but it seems to have shaken her. So on Saturday, she went back to her local hairdressers and the parade of shops in her town. The town is made up of three rooms, separate but knocked together in a way you could see through. The first by the door is the reception, which was unmanned, and where you would sit if you were waiting. The third room had the sinks, washing machine, and stairs to the upstairs. My mom was sitting in the chair with her glasses off, but looking into the mirror. She can still see, but not exacting detail, to be fair. But at some point, she became aware that someone was waiting by the reception counter. The person was standing patiently. He was tall and wearing a dark overcoat. He was standing there long enough that my mom became agitated that nobody was serving them. She was turning her head to see better, but the hairdresser asked her to be still. What's wrong? My mom said. I think you should serve that person. They've been waiting there for a while. The three other women looked at her blankly. There was nobody there, they said. That's when the hairdresser explained that they have a ghost. But usually he's upstairs. They've seen him several times. And she's so scared of being left alone, she avoids it at all costs. Mum felt instantly guilty. She didn't mean to scare her. She truly thought someone was waiting, so she played it down. Must have just been a person walking past, she said. But she said to me, she knows what she saw. When I was a child, I was scared of the dark. I swore to my mother I heard voices in it. They were not evil, but they were not familiar, and so they scared me. It was not uncommon in the middle of the night for me to wake up and hear whispers, as I would call them when asking my mom. She figured they were just bumps in the night and typical kids' nightmare material. I tried often to explain to her that it was more than that, that they sounded different from one another the way people's voices do. On some nights I would get so scared from these whispers that I would sleep in my mom's bed with her. It was an added bonus that the bathroom was directly outside of her bedroom door from my late night tinkles. I should add at this point that when walking out into the hall to go to the bathroom, you look directly down the stairs that would lead you into my living room on the first floor as my mom's bedroom was on the second floor. On one such night, around Christmas, I awoke and felt the need to relieve myself. I walked out from the door and distinctly heard the phrase, look, and to my astonishment, a red light, almost like a spotlight, was cast upon the wall at the very bottom of the stairs. The light had no other source, it was by itself, and I was transfixed by it, being a little kid, and it only being a few days from Christmas, I knew what this light was. It was Santa. How else could he get into my house to know I was being a good boy? I was so excited I began walking down the stairs to greet him, picking up my pace after the second step as it began to creep off the wall and fade into the darkness in my living room. That's when I heard him, a very strong, masculine voice, different from the first. Not at all like my father's, not to say he isn't masculine, it was just distinctly different. It said, stop, right now, go back up those stairs. I listened, turned around, and what happened next I am not sure I would believe if someone had told me this same story. After reaching the top of the stairs, 
I heard a very loud crash that sent me running back to my mother's bed where I jumped straight under the covers and stayed there the whole night. When we awoke the next morning, the poinsettia lights, little Christmas flower lights that glowed red, my mother had put on the railing down the stairs were pulled straight down to the bottom of the stairs, some broken from what seemed like a forceful tear, laying in a single pile. The dry sink in my living room had fallen from the wall. My mother could not explain it. My father was worried we had been the victims of a home invasion. My sister was crying. There was nothing missing, nobody had broken in, there did not seem to be any reason this had happened. And then I saw it, and I kept quiet about it because I was so afraid that I could not force words out of my mouth. There, on the edge of the wooden dry sink which had been facing up, were three indentations where the finish on the wood had been worn, almost as if in a forceful grip. Something down there had grabbed it and threw it down. That was what the bang was that I was mortified. After that day I never heard a single voice again. I do not like to imagine what was waiting downstairs for me that night, if it was anything at all, but I can tell you that the reality was that something had physically acted upon two things in my house near the bottom of that stairwell. After this, I had never heard another whisper again. Which is sad because in some ways I would have liked to thank the man, it was a masculine energy, that had stopped me from going down those stairs. This happened when I was seven. I am twenty years old now, and because of this incident I am still afraid of the dark.